This episode of The Candid Frame is sponsored by the Charcoal Book Club. Working with the most respected names in contemporary photography, Charcoal selects and delivers essential photo books to a worldwide community of collectors. Each month, members receive a signed first edition monograph and an exclusive print to add to their collections. Join the club by visiting charcoalbookclub.com and use the promo code the candid frame at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. Humans have a necessary and unique relationship with animals. City living can lead us to focus on domesticated animals as pets, but our relationship with animals is much more complex than that. We rely on them for our food, clothing, and so much more. In the U.S., organizations such as the 4-H Club focus on the personal relationships between people and their animals, especially livestock. The resulting competitions fascinated photographer R.J. Kern, who created a project titled The Unchosen Ones. There he focused his lens not on the winners of these competitions, but the young men and women who had not earned the top prize. The portraits and the accompanying stories provide a rare glimpse in today's rural life in today's America. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. Well, uh, thanks for making time for me on a Monday. Hey, my pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I've been looking forward to the conversation. I really have enjoyed the book. I get a lot of books and a lot of proposals for people to talk to. Um, got a limited number of spots, and a lot of uh, a lot of them, good percentage tend to be portrait books. So usually I'm, I'm kind of looking for something that sort of goes beyond just the subject matter. And I think your book is a really interesting one on a variety of different cases, which is, I was eager to have a chance to, to talk to you about it. Um, but well, thank you. Yeah. first, explain to people what it's about and, and the choice of the title, The Unchosen Ones. Sure. Well, the unchosen ones really are all of us. And I think we all know what it's like not to be chosen for something in life, whether it be for love or sports or a job. If you're a photographer, maybe a jury group exhibition. And it's really that resilience, right, to bounce back that ultimately defines us and shapes going forward. And, you know, I was began this project and I'm being an, almost an outsider to agricultural life here in Minnesota, which is outside of the Twin Cities. It's, it's fairly rural. And I didn't grow up on a farm. Um, my dad was in the military and we moved around a lot. But I love this notion of having roots. And you, 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 know, you stop off the grocery store and everyone knows your name. And this is mm-hmm. a sense of community and support. So I went out to like continue photographing the sheep and goats, which was uh, just kind of a personal project for me, um, stepping outside of the computer, you know, kind of into the pasture with rubber rain boots and my lighting equipment. And uh, this was during an election year, right, 2016. And it was interesting that here so many kids put emphasis on winning and mm. who, who's going to be the best, right? And Yet not only not always can everyone be a winner, right? There's a first place winner and a second place and a third place. And yet these kids work so hard to raise their animals for a year and take care of them. They have to feed them before they eat breakfast in the morning. Um, it's a lot of sacrifice, especially in the wintertime. I mean, it, they're getting up there mine, below zero degrees Fahrenheit, you know, outside. And so my heart really went out to them. I'm just like, hey, I wanna, I'm here to learn more. I, I'm, I promise to put them in the best light possible. And so that's what was really impetus for the project in 2016. It, you mentioned that you were photographing uh, animals before. And one of your first projects in, involved these sort of picturesque portraits, uh, largely made in, in Ireland, influenced um, by your own family heritage and also you know, your fascination with with painting, how did that transition from that to these portraits of these of these young people? Sure, yeah. 
Well, I know you, you've had a lot of big legends on this podcast. Uh, even one of my early photographic heroes, Joe McNally, right? Mm. And I think a lot of photographers, especially that have been published in magazines like National Geographic, tend to focus on the exotic, the rare, the endangered, right? The elusive. And I'm really not interested in that because there's so many other photographers that just do that that much better than me. And I really love finding kind of this beauty in the normal, um, the everyday. And so for me to just draw on this inspiration from mid 19th century kind of European landscape painters that often feature these kind of very bucolic scenes and, and animals were just pr present in those scenes. And I, it was a huge inspiration, both slowing down kind of doing a study of something, paying close attention to light and the color of that light and composition and the overall story in the composition. That was really important. And um, that's what kind of inspired that entire, my first monograph, The Sheep and the Goats, you know, looking at these very ordinary animals, mm -hmm. yet they revere this almost mythical status and if you're a L.A. Rams fan, <laughs> right, <There's, laughs> these Rams are very common and they won the Super Bowl, right? They're the mascot for NFL teams. And we see the same ram, like the, the, the sheep, right? It, the sacrificial lamb in biblical stories, right? Yeah. So here is this kind of almost commonplace animal, but humans have had this relationship with goats and sheep you know, long before dogs and cats, according to National Geographic. I mean, you know, goats were one of the very first domesticated species. And so I was really interested in this relationship, how humans have kind of co-evolved with these animals, both for fiber and milk, cheese, companionship, yeah. meat. And we've influenced them just as much as they've been kind of influenced us. You know, many of these animals we're from all different parts of the world. And like me, I'm, I'm an immigrant. My, my family's immigrated here in the United States, right? Two generations ago. And these animals, much like they were on ships and they came here to the United States and, you know, to start a new life. And there was a lot of metaphor in that. Yeah. I was really interested in exploring. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that really kind of interested me about, about the project was thinking about the sort of the disconnect that we who live in in cities have in terms of our relationships with with animals for a large part of the world that direct relationship with animals still exists but if you live in a in a big city you know there's this there's this gap there's this disparity we don't really have any relationship with animals other than possibly our our pets and it's fascinating to see how these children not only are sort of an indicator of an aspect of at least American culture in terms of the relationship between domesticated animals and food production in this country, but the idea of seeing the relationship between two living creatures. Now, it's not just the fact that they're training these animals and caring for these animals, is that there is there's an appreciation and an understanding of the role that each is at least the animals are playing in their direct lives and also in their in their communities. When you started the project, how conscious of you were you of that? Or were you approaching it primarily from aesthetics? in terms of what they might look like in a photograph. How did the two complement each other as, as in the beginning and as the project uh, progressed? I was hyper conscious of it. And, you know, county fairs are essentially a, 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 a beauty contest, right? Or a bodybuilder contest. If you, you know, mm -hmm. if you were to draw a parallel between like where humans go for competition and a lot of it is based on aesthetics. We're at a 4-H judging arena, for example, on the sidelines of a county fair the agricultural expert there, the judge, is looking for the loin, you know, all these anatomical features of the animal that maybe the butcher would appreciate, right? Or joints, making sure that the working animal is strong enough to provide sustenance, whether it be wool or milk 
long term for the farm, right? These are working mm-hmm. animals. And yeah, it was interesting. I mean, you go back and look at 80s fashion <laughs> and these fashion trends, what was popular then are very different than what's popular yeah. today. Not that much different than animal husbandry. Um, if you go back to 40 years ago, the three or three quarters of a goat were what the butchers were really after, right? So you get these kind of overdeveloped rear three quarters, like the rear legs. But what they found is just the animals would prove to have more joint related issues. It was, it was almost like you put too much muscle mass on a human mm-hmm. and you might have joint related issues, right? With mobility and just moving around is that much more taxing, right? Now, if you look at a lot of the supreme champions, so the best of the best, right? It's going to be the front three quarters, right? Loin, you know, those shoulders. That's what they're really looking for because they know it's a healthy, it's healthier for the animal long term. So just by essentially like selective breeding in terms of, okay, you've got the supreme champion ram. I want those genetics if you're a real competitive person, or you just want to be constantly kind of improving the quality of your produce that you're creating. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's really what agriculture is about, you know, and if there's a lot of friendly competition <laughs> that <laughs> comes into that, right? You know, th- that's where we're essentially kind of shaping the course of this animal's existence and genetics. And what I find fascinating is if you look back at the first kind of animal contest. It's about 1850, uh, New York State Fair. And if you look at what was the first exhibition of photography was 1850, kind of the World's Fair mm-hmm. in London. And so both photography and animal contests kind of share this birth story and ha- both yet have been heavily influenced by you know, technology, whether it be hormones and antibiotics, steroids, right? With cameras, we've got lenses and you know, optics and lighting and that have greatly influenced our medium. And so that, that I like that seeing that, that visual conversation in play. Um, and that's one of the reasons too, if you look at some of the very first photographs um, from 18, salt prints, um, you know, 1840, 1850, there are often of prize winning animals. Mm. So like Adrian Tournejean, Nadar, kind of mid 19th century France, You know, that's because people had the means, but they were also forming this document of what this animal looked like for breeding purposes so that they can kind of market the animal, if you will. For your approach of those initial, you know, pictures, you know, uh, I saw a presentation where you were talking about your inspiration from from paintings. And one of the things that's, that's interesting about the photographic process between at least the modern photographic process and the way it's approached in that of painting is is for the photography. There's, there's a tendency for colors to be sort of dominant as a way of sort of controlling the viewer's experience to the the extent that they seem to be emphasized more so than maybe other aesthetics, Mm -hmm. you know, line shape, Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe even light to it to a certain degree. And what's interesting about the photographs Mm -hmm. that in your initial series, I I see that you're, you are certainly using color, but there is a more subtle use of color in relationship to all those other aesthetics. But I wonder, is it a challenge because the, the camera is capable of giving you so much? Is it even more difficult to achieve that kind of aesthetic? Oh, for sure. And our, our eyes can are very intuitive in how we read light and see light and what we determine is natural light or real light, right? Mm-hmm. It's maybe reflected light off a window or through a window versus something that's been artificially set up with maybe strobes, right? And we get that kind of subconscious look that, oh, that looks fake, right? That doesn't right. look real, so to speak our eyes, right? Even though the light is there, right? It's just, we've, we're using artificial light to create that. You know, I, if you take like a, not to talk technicals too much, but just your standard flash, right? That light is very clean and the sun doesn't work like that. The sun is, you know, we're bouncing light, reflecting light, refracting light. And if it, if you're standing in a green field at noon, 
and you look under your chin, what's the actual color of that light reflecting off mm -hmm. the grass? It's not white, right? It's gonna be a tinge of green because it's, it's reflecting off the grass. And I, that's where it's like that, that subtle nuance of paying really close attention to like the color of the light and the shadows. That's what painters did yeah. really well. Every brush stroke and color choice was deliberate. Right? They, it's very rare that you'll see a true jet black in a painting because even when there's, the, there's an absence of light, if you look really carefully and you, you know, you look, it's like, oh, no, it's, 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 there's something maybe red nearby or purple nearby that's going to lend itself to a cooler color, right? Or if you look at shadow detail, let's say of white sheep in paintings, okay? You know, the underbelly part of the animal right. where it's mm -hmm. shaded, right? That's not going to be dark black, right? And so in my, in, I re in the second part of the Unchosen Ones project where I re-photographed the youth and I was often in environments outside. Sometimes they're in their driveway. You know, I created this project socially distant, essentially during lockdown in 2020 outside. I was really wanting to mimic that reflected light. And there's, I would say about 10 or 12 images. If you pay close attention you will see a green color cast. And that's why it's like this um, very intentional, kind of chromatically complex light will read as real, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you point it out, then you're like, oh, what's going on here, <laughs> right? But if you, upon first look, it's like, oh, that totally looks natural. Experts of this would be like, gosh, he has more Time Magazine covers than anyone else. And he's oh. done, he, he did this portrait of Mike Bloomberg. I'm drawing a blank too, but I Greg need to- Greg Heisler, of course. Greg, Greg Heisler. Correct. Yep. And he's very a master of using color carefully in shadows, you know, tinges of blues and greens to make it look very, this painterly aesthetic, right? That yeah. um, he's basically mimicking versus if it's this really pristine, clean light, our eye, when we see it, it's going to render as fake. Yeah, because I because yeah. I get to look at a lot of photographs and especially, I, I'm not really adept at using strobe something I'm trying to learn. But when I do look at works like of Winters or Heisler's and yours and several other people, I'm often looking at sort of the subtlety because the tendency is to sort of look at the obvious in the terms of determining the position of the light or what kind of light miter fire was used, how it's shaped, you know, the contrast ratio. But then, you know, real masters of, of light understand that it is, it's a component that's, not just doing something to the subject, but to the scene. And it's it's kind of like you add something, you add a, you're cooking something and you add something to the recipe. It's not that, you, that, that one pinch of salt or that X of cloves of garlic is just going to make that thing more pronounced. It's going to shape and influence everything. It's going to transform everything. And I think that's what I really like about people who are very, conscious about light beyond simply the technical and what led you to create the, the look for these was an accident i read that you you did a test and you either didn't bring the battery or the pack didn't work but the resulting look taught you something what was that i was going after a little bit more higher contrast aesthetic um a little bit more fashion forward aesthetic um, in my mind when mm -hmm. I started this, this test. And this was, this was in 2015. So the year before I began the project and it was a sync cord that didn't, wasn't working. Right. So I, I, my strobes couldn't fire. And so I just went with looking at the natural light and it was a soft kind of Northern facing light. So it's your typical window light. Um, where it's just omnipresent, right? It's mm -hmm. almost difficult to re engineer where, where's the light coming from? Um, and it, I like that intentionality of that, that aesthetic. Um, it, it, it's, it's very flattering for the animals. It's very flattering for the kids, especially many of them are wearing white. That's the traditional uh, uniform, if you will. Like when the milkman 
delivers mm-hmm. your milk. There, you know, in many dairy industries, just for cleanliness, they wear the white. And so you have to be really careful about hot spots and when you're dealing with someone all dressed in white, um, especially on their skin. And uh, you, you, you want to put them in the best light possible. And that's, that was what I was really going after. And that's what I took away from that happy mistake. And at the time, I was very frustrated. But then I was like, oh, you know what? There is something here. And I love that you used the, the analogy of cooking. Because mm-hmm. right? I think light is often one of those little nuances that photographers we, we use. It's one of our little tools, much like a chef would use acidity, right? Lemons or uh, salt, right? Or seaweed from unami. Or, um, and a little bit, it really enhances the rest of the piece, right? Too much. You know, if you over season or mm-hmm. over salt, it could kill it. Like, yeah. whoa, and you get this repulsion to it, right? And that's, I think, the delicate balance, right? When you're using lighting is, is how much do you use just enough so that it expresses kind of what you, what you want the viewer to feel when they look at the photograph. Well, the famous quote from W.C. Fields is, never work with children or animals. You're doing both. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> and you know you're approaching these young people you know after they found out that they haven't won explaining what you're doing and setting this up to make a, a portrait which you know it is a challenge in a variety of different ways you know you've got the technical stuff down which is oftentimes the easier thing to do but tell me about the collaboration with someone who really is not accustomed to being in front of the camera. And especially when they may be in a very sort of emotional state after being disappointed by the outcome. Right. I mean, trust is most important and that's where you kind of lean into your human to human skills with empathy. Right. And you know, they're right off the judging line. When I first met, those 65 kids in 2016, um, when I traveled to 10 different counties. And the judge would line them up, you know, and from if there's 30 kids in the division, you know, the grand champions would be on one side of the judging arena and he would kind of line them up. And on the far other side of the arena would be the kids that, well, they got to work harder next year. Mm-hmm. And it was, you could tell some of them were frustrated, but overall, like they were, had a great attitude. And they were ready to take on tips on where they could improve. And they had a good sense of humor. And they were, for the most part, patient in working with their animals. And so when I approached them, and I promised them, I'm going to put you in the best light possible. And I'm not here to make fun of you, right? So I, the biggest thing was getting permission from the parents and um, explaining to them what, what I was working on and I had a little portfolio of prints with me that I brought to help introduce them to my work, my aesthetic, that I'm working on a grant project, uh, which gives intent. And they say, mm-hmm. oh, okay, you're, you're, you are thoughtful in your approach. And so that helped to garner that rapport. And yes, though, <laughs> working with kids, working with animals is you definitely need a sense of humor and patience because – there is a certain element that you just cannot control. You have to be hyper present when you're there. Of course, safety of the animals and safety of the youth is number one in my mind, right? I would hate for a sea stand with a heavy light come crashing down yeah. on a kid uh, or an animal, right? So that's why I'm very hyper kind of conscious of making sure that there's sandbags on equipment and there's not cords that are tripping hazards and, of course, working with a studio backdrop, <laughs> you know, you're, they could step back onto the backdrop, the whole thing falls. Fortunately, none of that happened. So I was very fortunate on that. But it's once you have them set up and I invite them into this space and, you know, the, the kids, I think at first just wanted to smile. And I said, you know what, I, I really want, you know, let's, let's take a moment to think about in a year from now. You know, if you were the grand champion, what would that look like? What would that feel like? You know, all right, let's put on that persona. Let's, let's, let's pretend like we are envisioning this success in a year from now. And that 
that certainly, the, like, the kids had never really thought about that. Right? The, it was planting this seed of hope for the future. And you could tell, like, they were, I was interested in them. Mm-hmm. And so that, the fact that we had this little conversation was a really good starting point. And then, of course, when they see with their, you know, their shoulders up high and their chin up high and they're, they're, they're confident and they're, they, 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 they've, they're used to seeing themselves in cameras and in, in photographs, smiling, like, you know, yeah. the selfie and this sort of thing. But then when, when I showed them the back of the camera, that helped them right away. Just, oh, wow. Oh, I see. And that was a really useful component to make sure like, Hey, we want about five minutes of time. And, and, uh, you know, I said, all right, just hold it, hold the animal, you know, how, how you feel the most confident. Um, and then what was interesting is four years later, you know, I stayed in touch with a lot of the kids and I was able to re-photograph 50 of the kids, right? Took about four months of time. Um, it was a lot harder than the first time around because I had to drive mm-hmm. all the way out. And some of the kids are four or five hours away. And, but that time, the second time I photographed them, it's in the, it's the way the book is laid out in this diptych where the portraits are from 2016 are on the left and then the portraits from 2020 on the right. And at that time, I was really, they were much of a collaborator as they were a subject. Mm-hmm. And we've known each other, right? The first time around, they, they only met me five minutes prior for the most part. And this second time, they were allowed to kind of choose where do they want to be photographed? What do they want to be doing? What is their thing now? Yeah. And that's, we just kind of left it at that and let them drive the portrait session. And I just was there to support and put them in the best light possible. And, and so that's why you, you get these very kind of, you see some of the kids still have the same animals that they're working with. And so you see this change in the animal uh, over time four years is, is a long time especially for these animals that only live eight nine years you see the of course the obvious change is changing the kids right. the youth and you have an eight-year-old and a 12-year-old it, there's there's a lot of maturing that goes on in those years and so to see bear witness to that um, especially as a parent where every day you don't see your own kids grow but then in a year, you're like, oh, my gosh, like, it's just right. Um, it's one of the things that photography does very well is it records all these little nuances of detail that when we look back, we can really relish in, in on that. And that, that was a, kind of a one component of the project that surprised me after I finished it. It's like, wow, you know, that that yeah. change is what held my attention the most because when I, I really took a long time looking at the at the diptychs and one of the things that i picked up on is that for a good number of the kids there was a sense of i had the word before but it's not self-awareness but a a sense of personal presence that didn't exist the year before and it wasn't just that they were more conscious of how they looked in the camera, they own themselves in a way that they didn't when they were younger. And there's a, there's a young lady, Kenzie, who graces the cover of your book. And that, first off, is a great photograph. And she, she exhibits pretty much the same pose in both. But it was that sense of self-possession that, sh- that just screamed out at me that just made me just look at that photograph and just see that transformation. And I think that that's one of the beautiful things about the work, the beautiful thing that you created about with, with this project. But it also gave me a sense of where the power of a portrait really lies. Not so much in telling the truth of the person, but being able to capture, to capture a sense of who they are at that moment, not just what they physically look like. So I just just want to, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to note that that's something that really struck me. These kids in their life, I'm the success right off the bat. Right. And, you know, I wanted, when I re-photographed them, you know, I asked them, Mm -hmm. show me your best self. And that, 
that self-awareness you pick up on very well. And thank you for bringing that up. You know, there is this, especially with, I mean, when we grew up, we did right. not have mm-hmm. the same level of cyberbullying that's existing today and constant comparison of one's likeness to perfection. And as I mentioned earlier on this conversation, I'm not interested in perfection. I'm interested in the real, the normal. And so when I was able to, you know, the kids could see them again and, you know, they've had this experience now being photographed, you know, four years apart. And then it, I feel like there, there's this, is, there is a special connection. And that's why when I, if I'm going to be traveling back to the county fair, or giving a talk at the local historical society, mm-hmm. or, um, I'll invite them, reach them out. And it's always a great conversation just to c- catch up. And they still, every time they walk up and see their photo, I don't say much. I just stand back. But you can tell there's some emotional building blocks being put together by seeing their own likeness in this body of work that elevates them and what they do. Um, And that's important, I feel like. And and it helps to build that community as well, knowing that who knows what agriculture life is going to be in 50 years. Mm Mm-hmm. And where are we going to get our food? And we're, we're starting to see global food shortage supplies, especially um, getting enough labor, to, you know, to, to get the food from the farm to the table, right? Um, here in Minnesota, we have a fairly rich farm to table movement where we have a lot of ag- agricultural areas where we can get same day can be picked and for dinner on the table. You look mm-hmm. at areas like New York City where food is flown in from all over the world, right? The carbon footprint alone on that process is mind-boggling. That is just not sustainable long-term, right? And um, so to have that level of conversation at the county fair level, like say, hey, what you do matters. It is important, and I value that. Um, I think it, 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 it's a it's a healthy door to open to that line of conversation in rural America, where I feel like it's gotten a really bad rap, um, especially during like the Trump presidency and um, not everyone living in rural America is racist, right. Or homophobic. Um, And interviewing the kids was a really important part to tease out and ask them really important questions about what does black lives matter movement mean to you? Right. Given that George Floyd was murdered a mile and a half from my house. That was a really important question I wanted to ask the kids or how has COVID impacted their relationship with their friends and their family and their animals? And one of the things I found is the kids actually spent more time outside with their animals. They weren't having their um, school obligations necessarily or and a lot of their peers were spending a lot of time in front of computers. And a year later, we're now starting to see elementary level, like the impact on anxiety and mental health, right? From being so plugged into Zoom <laughs> to do as a second grader or a third grader, where they really should be outside working with their hands, being in fresh air. And so I looked at these kids raising their animals is almost a silver lining to COVID um, that, wow, maybe this is the pause and a reset that we really need that to remind us, yes, we do need to spend more time outside. Um, And something I could certainly benefit from with animals. I mean, what a luxury, right? My membership in the Charcoal Book Club challenges me in my photography. With each book, I not only discover a new photographer, but I also learn the various ways a photographer sees. I am endlessly fascinated by what each photographer chooses to photograph and how. It leads me to consider and reconsider what I think is worth documenting. With each book that lands on my porch each month, I receive inspiration and education. It's one of the best things about becoming a member of the Charcoal Book Club. It reminds me that there is always something new for me to learn. 
Become a Charcoal Book Club member today and enjoy a great new title every month. It's a flexible service. If you don't like that month's release, you can choose another of their titles of similar value. They offer free shipping in the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. It's subsidized elsewhere. Join the club at charcoalbookclub.com today and remember to use the code THECANDIDFRAME at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. And if you enjoy the work we do here at TCF, we can always do with your financial support. Each episode requires time, effort, and resources, and your donations help to make this show possible. You can contribute $5, $10, $20 or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash the Prime. If you've been thinking about doing it for a long time but never got around to it, why not take the time to do it today? It would be a great help. Thank you so much for your continued support. You know, I'm, I myself had the chance to photograph uh, 4-H first time, God, I forget how many years ago. And one of the things that I was really impressed was the focus and the dutifulness that the children exhibited. I have this one photograph of this kid, probably 10 years old, tying a knot. And he is so intense and focused on it. And he's like, he's biting his lips, his tongue is sticking out. And it was just, there was just, there was that intensity amazed me at someone so young, even though he was just sort of tying a knot. But you knew he was, he was completely focused on getting it right, doing it well. And I think that that's one of the, 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 the things that, you know, even though you were photographing them initially, at a contest that part of the character building has been the commitment to every day to do the work, even though they don't get celebrated every each day, you know, they don't get accolades or anything like that. Even at the end, when they go to the competition, they have this understanding of making the choice to do something, to do it well, and to derive a satisfaction from it, regardless of whether you are seen as a winner or not. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, the, those life skills, I think that's one of the core parts of 4-H in FFA, the Future Farmers of America, is to kind of instill some of these values of hard work, resilience, attitude, right? respect, right? treating your animals much like the same um, based off of their needs. And um, I mean, it's what it's a wonderful and almost feel like in, in this very kind of racial tension that we live in. And I feel like that which mm-hmm. what does not divide us can only unify us. And there's this interest with animals, for example, like, wow, what if this could be one of the things like inner city kids can learn more about animals? And that could be a wonderful bridge between what we often know as in Minnesota, there's you're, you're in the Twin Cities or you're out state, right? And there's this very deep divide. Okay. <laughs> Republican, Democrat, mm-hmm. right? There's very divisive things, right? Oh, you're, a, you're, you're, you're not wearing your mask. You must be Republican because you're... And yet, if we could, you know, have some conversations about, you know, what does it take to raise an animal? This is where your wool comes from, right? Wool does not grow on a plant, on a tree, <laughs> right? It comes from an animal. Mm. Um, or where does your cheese come from on your cheeseburger, right? <laughs> like getting kids to think about, it. yeah, it doesn't always come just from a store and a wrapper, right? But there's some animal that helped produce that. And there is someone helping to raise that animal, right? To produce whether it be fiber or cheese or milk and I look at that as, hey, there's something deeper here that we can explore, especially as it comes to, you know, well, I'm at welcoming greater diversity <laughs> in 4-H, um, welcoming greater diversity in rural areas. Um, and so that's, that's I've, I've got some projects going, work, you know, dabbling around and hoping to maybe get a grant to continue in that exploration. You know, um, the idea of family-owned farms is always something that's really, especially during a political period, it's thrown out all the time. Mm-hmm. 
despite all the importance it's given during a political year, it seems like uh, it's becoming more and more challenging for a family-owned farm to persist. Oh, incredibly so. And, and with these these children, you know, they're faced with you know very challenging decision, especially if it's been an industry that's been generational, right? right? They're, they're, they, they know the hard work that's involved in doing this, mm -hmm. you know, they, they've lived with it, but that they also, but now they also see the financial challenges and also, you know, that they may have other options now that their parents didn't have, exactly. but also maybe feeling sort of a, a familial obligation at the same time, which must be incredibly difficult. In terms of that, what kind of discussions did you have with with some of these young people specifically concerning that? Sure, sure. One of my favorite parts of the project when I asked them what's they're up to, you know, what have you learned from the last four years of working with your animals is to see that it helped to inspire them to become a veterinarian, for example, or start you know, a few of them are going to or college universities studying on agricultural communications, right? And so they really do want to do well financially, long-term, and they don't necessarily want to repeat the ways of the past where, um, you know, you had your thousand acre farm and you, you grew all your food and you went to the market once a week and you traded for things, right? Those, the mm -hmm. family farm here in Minnesota, we do have, a lot of century farms. And these are farms that have been continuously owned and operated for over a hundred years. And each fair, they, they announce more farms. So that's a, it, it's a lot of pride that comes from that. Um, but they're expensive. And a lot of times, <laughs> you know, there's years that there's no money being made. And I think a lot of the youth, when they mm -hmm. see that, they're like, that's scary. Like, they want to make money. They can go work at Best Buy and make a lot more money for a lot less dirty work than trying to, you know, sell eggs or shear um, wool on a sheep and try to, what do you do with the wool pelts, right? How do you bring them to market, right? Extremely difficult. And of course, corporate monoculture doesn't support that as easily as well, where you need a 10,000 acre farm just to break even, you know, with basic laws of economics and, and agriculture. A lot of the kids have moved on. They just decided, you know, we've sold off all of our animals. It's gotten to be too much. Uh, grandma is not old enough to help out. And my parents live closer to town and I've got sports stuff going on. And I, I just don't have the time to help on the farm. And that, they're, my heart aches, right? And it, Kids change, right? I, I, if I was forced <laughs> to do one thing my whole life, I, of course, would pull my hair out. Um, in Minnesota, we've got hockey, um, a lot of outdoor activities like fishing. Um, and so the kids, you know, every couple of years, they, of course, they change their interests as well. Um, I had a, a wonderful conversation with a young lady who spent her upbringing in this rural area of Hubbard County, Minnesota. And she was really concerned about what city life would be like. And after she graduated high school, she's now living in St. Paul. So it's in the Twin Cities and was really open arms with the level of diversity. And her boyfriend, as a Latino, brought with her um, to the shoot, the photo, photo shoot, and She's just like, it really opened my eyes. And I really like this difference that's here in the Twin Cities. And she was very articulate explaining this. And she's like, it was very different the way my parents explained it to me growing up. So to have some of those eye-opening experiences as, as rural youth mature and grow and you know spend more time, like not every city is full of violence and crime as it's portrayed in the media. There are still nice people here. Mm -hmm. Some big important changes have been made since George Floyd was murdered, right? It's sad that it happened here, extremely sad, but things are changing for the better and the kids pick up on it and they're not necessarily the same views as the conservative views that their families once maybe grew up with. I was really inspired by that. 
Um, you mentioned earlier that when you returned to photograph the, the kids, mm -hmm. um, that because of COVID, they weren't as intimate. Uh, that that may informed how you compose the shots. In, in a lot of the latter photographs, you include a lot more of the environment, the, the family farm, the you know the grain silos, the, the machinery, which involves a completely different sort of aesthetic in terms of building this sort of environmental portrait. Tell me about how th that factor, mm -hmm. the, the restriction in distance and including more of the space mm -hmm. helped you to reconsider what you were doing in terms of creating a portrait. Well, place matters. The fact that these portraits were not taken in a studio, that they're out on location in their the home pasture or these the farm where these kids were, it was really important. And to really embrace this kind of messiness of farm life, right? A couple parents were like, oh, I wish I wish I had a little bit more time. I would have mowed the lawn and all this before you came. I'm like, no, 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 it's fine. Mm -hmm. right? This is great. This is what I like. It's real, right? Um, doesn't need to look like a golf course. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I joke that I have a master's degree in cultural geography. And that my geographer's license is right next to my artistic license in my wallet. And this notion of, you know, some of the grain silos, right? These in 50 years, I, I think we will look back and like the, the almost a time capsule of this is the way agriculture life w is today. We take it, many, those who live there just take it for normal, right? Like this is it. However, there's a few photographs that with farm implements all a part of this scene, I don't even know the name of the farm implement and what it does. And so I learned a lot in this process. Um, what uh, you asked about the reason why the pullback, uh, what was maybe informing that, it wasn't as much as intentional when I started. Um, I knew I wanted to do an audio recording for the youth and ask them questions. Uh, the same kind of set of questions that I would, I wasn't sure at the time what I would do with as so maybe just having audio recordings could help support an exhibition experience. Then I decided, was like, well, I'm going to take a deep dive into video and literally set my camera up on a tripod and had decent audio mic'd up in the lavalier. And I needed a quiet spot. And so that's why a lot of times I would choose the barn where wind wasn't mm. as much of an issue. A lot of chickens and just farm noises <laughs> going on in the background that as you're trying to do a recording can be very distracting or construction vehicles out in the background. So that was really the impetus. Um, and especially if it was going to be rainy, I wanted to make sure I, we had a spot that we could be for an hour, everyone could be relaxed. And, and then I started looking on the inside of these barns and how much character and story and it's part oh, of the whole yeah. environment. And that's where I was like, gosh, I've done all this work and let me just step back. So it was really only about halfway through the project where I would step way back, put a wider angle lens on and just take in the overall environment. And that became the critical mass photo series for Photo Lucida uh, last year that won the top 50, uh, where all these kind of landscape environmental portrait pullbacks, if you will where the portrait is there in the backdrop, but it's situated in the context of kind of the urban or the, the rural pasture now, their home. And uh, mm -hmm. I think we'll look back on those and, and read into that in 50 years, far more than we probably will today. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you found, you know, discovered the insight in that accident. Because yeah. cause for me, those spaces were as much a character as the people that you were photographing. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that I was seeing a working farm. Mm -hmm. You could see it from the peeling paint, you know, the, the conditions of the trucks, the, the vehicles, these things are being used. This is not, this is not the sort of a imaginary idealized, you know, family farm that, you know, people may sort of imagine. This is real. Mm -hmm. sure. And I, I loved being able to, see what I was seeing in, in, in the young men and women, but also seeing it in, within the context of the spaces. It just gave me a fuller appreciation for who they are and the lives they're, they're leading. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it complements itself really, really well. Thank you. Um, one of the things that you, 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 you 
do besides the photographer is that you uh, uh, do have a martial arts school, right? And, you know, we began the conversation with this, uh, you know, this idea of, you know, the 4-H and the competition and, and winners and losers. Right. right. So when it comes to martial arts, you know, that's the first thing people think about. They think of a Bruce Lee movie and they go, Bruce Lee's going to win. Everyone else is going to lose. So, you know, how how has, you know, the sensibility that that, you know, that you were sort of picking up on in terms of you know, these subject matters, the lesson learned, mm -hmm. sort of shape how you teach, you know, kids that are very much the same age as the ones that you photograph. Right. I think to teach mental strength is very different than teaching physical strength, right? What it means to be mentally strong and, and especially the ability to perform under pressure. And, you know, we saw that on the global stage in the Olympics, how the, pr the pressure placed on mm -hmm. the athletes how intense that is. Even after years of training, they still get nervous. And I think if you could, whether it be public speaking or doing a dance routine or performing at a high level, you know, in a sports game, if you can train that mental toughness, right, on how to stay focused, how when things don't go your way, it doesn't rattle you. Like you just keep on keeping on. That is a valuable life skill that is directly transferable to becoming a Fortune 100 executive or attorney, a teacher, a physician, a professional, longer term in your life. You know, I love creating that kind of positive. I'm not, you know, much like in my photographs, I'm not there to make fun of them. I'm not ever when I'm teaching martial arts there to make the kid cry on the floor, right? I know each one pushing them just mm -hmm. beyond their their perceived limits. And then when they realize like, wow, I can break those two boards with my hand or foot, right? Where they thought that would be an insurmountable feat. That is one of the goals of life skills that I try to teach um, through the Taekwondo little club that I had in martial arts uh, in, in Minneapolis. It, it, it was impressed upon me at an early age. Um, I was never a team sport kind of person. And yet to have those lifelong sports that I can still continue in my 40s and 50s and 60s, you know, these things, whether it be running or biking or s swimming or things that, that, that don't necessarily require an entire team to do, I think are really important for both mental health and physical fitness, but also continually to test that kind of mental toughness. Like, gosh, if I if, I, if I'm getting an interview and I don't know what the answer is, but I'm on live TV, I hope I can come up with an answer, right? Or if I'm in a portfolio review and I'm having a curator asking me some really mm -hmm. challenging questions, how can I articulately pivot or answer them even though every single word is being scrutinized, right? Um, that's yeah. that's me mental toughness, right? And uh, demonstrated. So it's a big, big thing. So, so what, what, what do you do in terms of your sort of mindset when it comes to applying all of that that we've been talking about mm -hmm. to yourself and your photography? Because as you said, you know, you're working on projects, mm -hmm. you're applying for grants, you're trying to get your book pl published, you're trying to get exhibitions, you're trying to get, you know, publicity, all these things, mm -hmm. right? And it's a lot of work, mm -hmm. uh, you get a lot of no's, you get a lot of non-responses, uh, there are days where you just go, is it really worth it doing it <laughs> one more time? So, so tell me when it, when it comes to your photography, what do you, what do you personally do to keep yourself girded up yeah. or, or to sustain you, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, when you aren't doing, cause you, you know, the best part of it is when you're making the photographs and you're engaging with someone, that's the best part. The other stuff is just the drudge work that you have that you have to do, mm -hmm. and it's also can be the most disheartening part of what we do. Sure. So how do you how do you manage that? Yeah, you know, I think having that patience, that grit, those character traits of tenacity um, that we often associate with like high achievers. That's I I, I look at as mental toughness on stage and. You know, I think a lot of people like try to focus on goals. Like, I want to publish a book. I want to land gallery representation. I want to have a solo exhibition. And a lot of that we cannot control. However, what we can control, 
right? Is is not necessarily the result uh, because the result is often unknown or as we call unknowable, if you will. What you can focus on is like your effort, right? And that's the, the effort is this kind of that process that you follow to get there. Like your daily regimen, your daily practice, your weekly goals. Like, okay, I'm going to block off this time to do this particular project. And that having that discipline, you can do that if you're mentally tough and follow through with that. Um, and I think the, the, the big difference, I think, is that, that, that kind of what's in between the ears, right? That, that focus on getting your goals, mm-hmm. not the end all be all thing, but it's like, okay. I'm, I'm going to do this every week and I'm, I'm going to give myself this time and I'm going to put this energy in and I don't care what other people think. I just, I need to do it because I need to do it myself. Um, and I, especially mm-hmm. I think if you talk with a lot of artists that, you know, they're really freaked out by failure and um, those consequences can be very easily drive them to become distracted and away from what their goals really were set and I like this notion of trying to kind of not necessarily have like armor on you that everything, maybe you might get naysayers or doomsdayers, like that they want to just pick apart what you want to do. But instead of like having that as your, your armor to protect you, you know, use your mind as a weapon to your advantage, right? And not necessarily a shield. Um, and what I really mean by that is I think it's so easy, you know, to draw back on our DNA and, oh, when things get comfortable, I just want to sleep in underneath my warm blanket and not do what's the hard work, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's built into our DNA, the survival mechanism, right? Where if we hear a snap in the woods, we flip out because the saber toothed tiger is going to come and eat us, right? Um, with this adrenaline fight or flight tendencies, right? it's not that much different on social media. Like, ah, this is too hard. I'm going to check out and go look at Facebook and get my dopamine hits that way. And really you're, 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 you're being distracted is what you are. Right. So yeah. that's a really long kind of life skills thought process. Uh, no, here. but that's, that's, but, but I think it's, a yeah. no, it's important. I think, cause I think that's, once you've dedicated your life to doing this, whether it's full time or part time, um, amateur or professional, that's where the struggle is, right? Sure. And and that's what separates the wheat from the chaff, mm-hmm. right? And you see that exhibited in these in these kids, where they're not that they're not defined by the fact that they lost, mm-hmm. right? And I think it's just an important lesson that that unfortunately, in this modern culture, isn't 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 taught so much is about winning, mm-hmm. and if you're not winning. It's not that you're a loser, but you're not worthy. Mm-hmm. And I think that's such a destructive, you know, thing to teach anyone, especially kids, mm-hmm. right? Because they're going to pass that along, sure. and there only can be so many winners. That's right, right? So to to, to dismiss everyone as being worthless unless you're a winner is a terrible way for a culture to thrive and try to sustain and nurture. It's children. And it's also like the kid that got fifth or sixth place has to maybe work a little harder. And it's that tenacity that as they carry on in their life is what ultimately serves them. As opposed to if this is their first time showing and they get grand champion, well, then now what? (laughs) Right? So, Mm -hmm. It's so much about perspective. I, I, years ago, I read this article about uh, Olympic athletes, and they talked about you know second and third, and that the third place winner often felt better than the second place winner because the second place winner felt like, ah, God, if I just done this, I would have won first place, and the third place was just like, I made it, you know, and it was just a very interesting insight into how perspective can oh, be because sure. yeah. here are here are the top athletes at, at the given sports in the world mm-hmm. and even then you know the choice of perspective makes a huge difference yeah it's it's just incredibly valuable lesson 
And we see one of my favorite movies is Cars, the Pixar movie. With the, and at the mm-hmm. very first sentence, Lightning McQueen you know, is losers. I eat losers for breakfast or something like that. I like <laughs> 42 winner. Yeah, yeah, it was just this like, whoa, this is the kids movie. Like, and here, right out of the gate, we're talking about winners and losers. And, yeah. Right? Um, I think that's the job, too, of, of the parent, that burden um, or being a leader in your community is, is have those important conversations with kids and look at the, whether it be a playing field or your, whether on a sports contest or your judging re- arena for 4-H or your art show competition in your local high school, mm-hmm. you know, to have those important kind of confidence building conversations with the youth and having that support like, Hey, all right, what do you think you can work on? Okay. Let's, let's, let's keep on that. You know, let's break that, that up. And, you know, we can, in two weeks, let's revisit this. And then two more weeks, let's review. And then again, and, and then soon enough, in a year, the kids are like, Whoa, look what I've done. <laughs> you know, as parents, I yeah. see my kids go through this. I'm like, huh, I should be taking some of this myself. And, whether it be having a mentor or a life coach or um, just a good friend, it's those little check-ins are very important. So, you know, you've put so much of your life and your time and your money into this project, and it, you can't do something like that and not have it be transformative. So as a photographer, how has it been transformative? And as a parent, how has it been transformative? It's certainly reminded me of the importance of slowing down and being very present um as i mentioned early on when creating the work if your mind is distracted on set you know that's when things happen that you know people get hurt or um you miss focus and you think the shot's done and then you get home and like nope can't use that and then you kick yourself right Mm -hmm. um i think having a patience patience and a sense of humor as a parent especially when these things in life that we can't always control whether it be our kid well, now it's sick and I have to stay at home and work from home and help take care of them and try to be a parent and an employee or an entrepreneur and <laughs> juggle all these hats. It, it, it's tough. So that's that, that going back to there's of all the things in life that we can control. I always say there's this one thing that we can have 100% control over. And that's our attitude, that we can choose this mm-hmm. good attitude or we can choose a bad attitude and it's really up to us. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. And I, I tell myself that over and over again um, as I'm editing the, the videos that were published uh, late last year. You know, I'm, I'm listening to the advice that the kids are giving their other 4-H competitors. And I'm like, man, I mm. need some of this advice right now, right? Or, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, there's some wisdom being spoken and shared. and <laughs> uh, Yeah, I mean, I think any artist, the, the, the more you put yourself out there, and whether it be applying for grants or exhibitions or you, you're, you're going to, you know, produce a book and you're trying to get, you know, get the book out there in the world and, you, you may not get the results that you're thinking of. And so you just kind of have to keep it on, mm-hmm. have that good attitude. All right, well, my last question for each guest is I asked them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore on their own. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Well, I, I alluded to Greg Heisler early on um, in the conversation. So I think he would be an adept person to bring up. He is one that he shares as much as he likes to create. And he's now a full-time teacher at a university. I look up to that, right? That there's this, this, there isn't this thing as secrets that we have to hold close and trade secrets. And I don't want to share what I know and I'm a huge fan of both his technical acumen and his way of delivery and storytelling. And of course, the images speak for themselves. Um, the, 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 the customer service and just the peopleness of being a portrait photographer and a very, you know, people are, don't like always their photo being taken. So you have to have that kind of rapport all right, built early on to create that photograph and 
So I would say check out Greg Kleisler. He has got some wonderful little videos. I think Pro Photo put out a couple years ago. They're still live. Yeah. yeah, phenomenal. Two, three minute long. And I'm like, whoa, those are some mind melting good stuff. Oh, he's great. Well, RJ, it was so much fun and a pleasure to, to see your work and have a chance to talk to you about it. Uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you for being here. This is a wonderful opportunity and I appreciate it so much. Thanks to RJ for joining us. Find out more about his work by visiting rjkern.com. If you're a fan of our work, you have different ways to support us. You can write a review on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts and share a favorite episode on your social networks, be it Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. And you can support us financially by contributing via PayPal or Patreon. Thanks to Austin Beam and Evan S. Williams for their generous contributions. And if you can't find every episode of the show on whatever service you listen to podcasts, download the Candid Frame app available for Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ebody and X, and this is The Candid Frame. <laughs>